Hello, welcome to this video, and this video is going to be called Reevaluating John McGoughlin's Work After Mavishnu. Well, I think that's what it's going to be called. As I actually say that, it seems a terrible mouthful. Reevaluating the work of John McGoughlin after the Mavishnu. I think that says what it's, I'm going to talk about. Right, so um, I've done a ton of videos here about John McGoughlin. I'm, I made a mistake. Um, <laughs> right, shall we just, um, this is going to be a long video, right? This, is, this I'm really going to get deep into John McGoughlin. And um, first, let's um, start with my pronunciation of John McGoughlin. I am now promising to try and pronounce his name correctly because every time I do a video and I pronounce it John McGoughlin, um, people uh, moan and they say that's not how, not how you say his name. He's just put out a video, you know, um, pushing his uh, Polish tour or his Eastern European tour. And on that video, he sat there, I saw it the other day and he said, hi, this is John McGoughlin. And I thought, well, that's, he just said exactly how you, that's John saying how you say it. So, I vow on this video to now say it right. I'm going to stop saying John McGoughlin, which I've been saying for 40 years. My pronunciation comes from the video Meeting of the Spirits, where Larry Coriel introduces one of the tunes. And, and I think he says, um, this tune, is, which I think is Lotus Feet, is written by John McGoughlin. Glofflin. He says it different to me. That was the first time I ever heard the name mentioned. And I think as a young person watching that on the telly, forgetting the pronunciation, I started to say John McGoughlin, the, the most simplest way of saying it. I've been saying that for 40 years, N knowing that, not knowing that at some point in the future, I would have a YouTube channel where I talk, talk about John McGoughlin. Um, so much so I'm going to on camera here promise you I will say his name correctly from now on uh, and after I saw that video I went to the shop to get some biscuits uh, to have a nice cup of tea and some nice chocolate hobnobs and uh, on my way home clutching my biscuits I said to myself right Glock Glock Glockenspiel Glockenspiel Glock and then I thought Lynn Lynn Linda McCartney Linda McCartney playing a glockenspiel, and that is the image that I have put into my head. Right, Linda McCartney playing a glockenspiel, that is what I have put in my head in a sort of semi-hypnotic state, walking back from the shop with my biscuits. I have, I have tried to picture that, and I have now, I think I have that picture in my head, and when I think of John McGoughlin, John McLaughlin, it's going to be hard this is then um and hopefully that image will remind me of the correct correct pronunciation and the pronunciation nazis will no longer have a go at me because um they seem to get very upset by it it won't happen anymore i promise there are some hardcore john mclaughlin fans out there and they um Love this guy. I love this guy. We all love John McLaughlin. Um, I have talked to many John McLaughlin fans. And there is something that we often start to talk about. And I want to talk about it on this video. I'm three minutes in. Um, but I had to sort that pronunciation thing out, didn't I? Um, I want to tackle this on this video. I, I, I have shied away from it before but I think I'm confident enough now I have all these videos that show how much I love John McLaughlin that I'm hoping everyone will know how much I love this guy and I can get into this as a discussion so this is going to be a discussion about the post Mavishnu recordings so let's um paint the picture as I see it and the the um criticism that is often raised when it comes to John McLaughlin. Um, John McLaughlin emerges in the early 60s on the British session music scene. He travels down from Yorkshire to London. Um, he's, he, his ticket to London is his first professional gig, which is actually playing sort of traditional Dixieland jazz with the Pete Duca 
um, ensemble. Um, once in London, he gets a job in a record shop, a uh, music shop, and he's selling guitars and repairing those guitars. And slowly, I think he makes contact with a number of people in London um, that enable him to start to play on the session scene. The reason why he can play on the session scene is he has landed a gig with the guy that wrote the music for The Goon Show. It's a heavy reading gig and he's a very good player, very good sight reader. He's not known as a soloist on this session scene. He's, he's known as a rhythm guitarist, all right? So he often appears in a rhythm guitar role and you can go back and check the sessions out by John McLaughlin in the early 60s and he appears on all sorts of different records at that time. He plays on the Rolling Stones albums, he plays for Petula Clark, he plays for Georgie Fame, he plays for um, all sorts of different um, sessions, you know, Burt Bacharach, all, you know, he's, there is incredible footage from 65 of him playing rhythm guitar in an ensemble of guitar players, um, playing for Burt Bacharach. There's a, the, I think it's the very first video we can find of John McLaughlin. Um, he's also played with the Graham Bond band, which is a very early fusion band. It's fusing rhythm and blues with jazz. You know, he's working alongside um, Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce. He, 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 he forms a band with um, um, Duffy Power, which is a precursor to Cream. They make some incredible stuff. Um, he plays uh, on an album called Experiments for Pops. Experiments with Pops with Gordon Beck, where Gordon Beck is experiment with an early fusion. He plays on a Kenny Wheeler album, which is a sort of tribute to Don Quixote uh, called Windmill Tiller, I think. He's doing lots of jazz stuff, lots of session stuff, pop stuff, all this sort of thing. Now, one of the things that's really interesting that I haven't really brought up on this channel is John McLaughlin never really mentions this period at all. Um, he, at this point, he's he's playing alongside incredible session guitarists like Big Jim Sullivan. He's 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 mentoring young session guitarists like Jimmy Page. He's working alongside John Paul Jones. He's working with the Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. You know, he's been introduced to es esoteric ideas by the late great Graham Bond, who believed himself to be the son of Alistair Crowley. There's a whole wealth of strange and interesting um, information and facts. Uh, when, when John McLaughlin gets asked about this, he sort of glosses over this period. Um, if you read Colin Harper's Bathed in Lightning, it really opens up that. Because there's a good 10 years work of John McLaughlin working in London at the time that rock music is being forged. All right? It's an incredible thing. Um, he plays um, jazz, you know, with um, oh, the organ player. Um, I can't remember his name. <laughs> this is this is a minefield. He he uh, he he has uh, he plays jazz with Danny Thompson. I have all these recordings. I've got this stuff. I've really listened to some of the stuff he's doing. Um, by the time he's playing guitar on the Gordon Beck album, Experiments with Pops. He is channeling a sort of virtuoso, Tal Farlow approach to guitar mixed with a very advanced, almost like free jazz, Eric Dolphy, intervallic jumping way of playing. It's completely unlike what we associate with him in the Mavish Nocture, but it's that style with which he, he records Extrapolation. Extrapolation is one of the great British jazz albums of all time. Then he he then decamps to uh, New York and ends up playing with Miles Davis for an Tony Williams lifetime. Um, at that period, he's playing free jazz with Gunther Schuller. And um, if you check out the album he made with John Sermon, Where Fortune Smiles, you can hear that style of guitar playing, which suddenly disappears. It disappears, and, and then we hear In a Mountain Flame, and the guitar style is completely different, and he suddenly has this shredding virtuoso way of playing. Um, most John McLaughlin fans love these early pre-Mavish New Records. They love Extrapolation. They love Devotion, which is his sort of Hendrix power trio album. It's an incredible album. They love Tony Williams' Lifetime. 
You know, they love my goals beyond. It's such, it's such important. Now, everybody who loves John McLaughlin loves the pre-Mavish New Albums. Then the Mavish New Orchestra comes out. Now, most of us who are, are John McLaughlin fans are fans because of the Mavish New Orchestra. It's, it's what that represented. Now, what is it that the Mavish New Orchestra represents? Well, for me, there's a turmoil, there's a darkness there's a there's a, um, a pushing experience to the limit. It's spiritual, but it's sp spiritual in the way that you, you know, when you come to the Mavish Nuxia, you have to deal with it. This isn't incense and drones and feeling all trippy and going off on a sort of dreamy, you know, type of experience. This is something that has to be dealt with. I And the thing is, the incredible marketing that, that the Mavish had to do something, instrumental music that was so you know, difficult, you know, the loudest band in the world playing for three hours um, at, at huge volumes, huge amounts of bass spinning out the speakers. This is something that I was, um, I think it was one of the people on the, on my channels put a, um, a message up the other day saying they'd seen the Mavish Nuxia, the original lineup, and they were talking about the bass and how powerful the bass was and how the bass hit you in the stomach, how Cobham's bass drums hit you in the stomach and then the other range you had the extreme guitar screeching, you've got the violin screeching, all that huge range of frequencies coming at you and literally pummeling you. You know, half the audience, audience in an ecstatic state while the other half, you know, probably the girlfriends of all the guys had taken them there to this, this gig are sort of crying, you know. Um, and, and, you know, when I was a kid, I had the Columbia CBS Best on Mavish Nuxia and that tale was told about a guy going to see the Mavish Nuxia in 1973 taking his girlfriend and her sort of being in tears at having to go through this experience. That's what we associate with John McLaughlin, right? It's that that get, gets us there. Um, he makes the Love, Devotion and Surrender album. That is also full of this um, in-your-face, brutal jazz fusion that is spiritual and is taking to the same place that Coltrane's Ascension takes you. And This is what the Mavish New Orchestra is. It's the heaviest, darkest, Greatest band of all time. Um, he comes out of the Mavish New Orchestra in 1976, forming Shakti. Uh, Shakti is like um, the esoteric, gentle heart of the Mavish New Orchestra. And I think all us John McLaughlin fans, there's also unanimous love. Those who really know, know how powerful Shakti is. And there's an argument that Natural Elements is his greatest album. It's the ideas that John, McGough, John McLaughlin brings to music personified and boiled down to their essence. You know, it's his, got his greatest guitar playing on, some of his greatest compositions. So there I'm putting it out there. So we, ha we have this artistic peak with Natural Elements. He then returns to Electric Guitar um, with the albums Electric Guitarist and then The One Truth Band, um, and although that Mavish new thing is there, and a lot of time it's there because he, on the electric guitarist, is using those musicians, he's come back to those musicians. Uh, uh, with the One Truth Band, he has a band, I think, that was equal to the Mavish Nuxia and, and Burns and is as exciting and, and vital. Although the production of that album doesn't quite bring that out, I think. Although when we put on the Dark Prince, we hear... Um, John McLaughlin played full out, as extreme and as out there as he ever has, right? But there's a diminishment. Now, what is the diminishment? Something has gone. This darkness has gone. This turbulence, this turmoil has gone. As a kid, I used to put on Inner Worlds, which is the last Mavish New Orchestra album, and although I really liked it, and I was such a huge fan of Narada Michael Walden, and I loved his, I loved Narada's influence. It sounded like a Narada album more than a Mavish New. Um, John was sort of absent in a way from that album. I felt, you know, he's playing the guitar. The guitar's the guitar playing's there. It's incredible. Uh, but the compositions are there's there's everyone else is pitching in, and the compositions that that John McLaughlin has brought in a sort of jams. Something had gone, something had gone. And I, and I can remember looking at the cover of that album and looking into John's eyes and thought, something's happened here. He, he, he is turning his back 
on this. He's turning his back on this. It's, uh, this is, something's happened. Now, um, I think there is in the Mahavishnu a searching for something. There's a, there's a, a grasping at something and trying to achieve something through music. It could well be that that, that was achieved. Um, Shakti is so much more karma, but it still has the vitality, but it has the vitality of Indian classical music. Indian classical music is different to John Coltrane being influenced by Indian classical music because John Coltrane's music is also full of turmoil. It's full of angst. And um, somebody once said to me, the Mavish Orchestra is almost like somebody who wants to be spiritual um, dealing with their shadow. It's, it's someone dealing with the darkness that is there. And I think that's what resonates. Now, could it be that John McLaughlin, after that period, had, had got it sorted out? Well, John McLaughlin comes back and he's a, he, the music sounds different to me. It's, it's, he moves towards something which is much more sort of European, um, sophisticated, tasteful jazz. Okay? And he uh, really pursues this with the Translators Band. The band he has with Tommy Campbell on drums. Um, and uh, a whole bunch of European musicians, including Katia Lebec, who's an in a class, virtuoso classical pianist. Um, and those two albums are completely different. And I would say they are absent of everything that we loved about the Barishnu. Now, talking to John McLaughlin fans, I know many of them that then totally discard everything he has done after that point, all right? And this is the real meat of potatoes of this video. He's re-evaluating his catalogue since 1980, all right? Um, now let's just walk our way through it and see if I can come to any conclusions about it. Um, by the early 80s, that is when I discovered the Mavishnu. I'm eating up birds of fire and in a mountain flame and you know, between nothingness and eternity and visions of the emerald beyond apocalypse. I'm, I'm getting those albums. They were hard to get for me. I had to really find shops that could import them and or find them secondhand. And eventually I, I managed to pull it together. For about two years, all I had was Birds of Fire and the best of the Mavish Norkshire. That's all I had. Those are my two. And they were my favourite bands, you know. So um, there was always this mystery of what other albums would sound like uh, my favorite Mavish Yorkshire album is Visions of the Emerald Beyond. So to eventually get hold of a copy of that and bring that home and put it on and then be even more blown away. I think this is part of the reason why they influenced me so much because they never let up. It's like, it wasn't like they had one great album and I've discovered it. And then you go and buy the rest of the albums and not quite good. They just kept pummeling me with this stuff, you know. You know, I, would, I was getting hold of bootleg recordings of them and that was even more extreme you know um live at columbia live in munich you know i had a whole ton of bootleg recordings i had a um, bootleg recordings of the um tour he did with carlos santana with billy Cobb on drums the live in chicago that was immense this is this is that is my john mclaughlin it's those bootleg albums as well and in the early 80s i hadn't heard the translators it was not till later that i got those albums but suddenly, there's a new Mavishnu album. As he formed, reformed the Mavishnu Orchestra. When I went in to the shop, I could see I could order a new album. And it was just called the Mavishnu Orchestra. On the album, it's called Mavishnu. But I ordered an album. And this album comes through. It's got Billy Cobham on drums. It's got, you know, John McLaughlin on guitar. What is this? And I remember putting this album on. Now, for me... I just, I would have loved at that point anything that was on that album, you know. But the truth is, what we had was a sort of early 80s Fusak album, trying to push commercial buttons, you know, that, that labels like GRP were trying to push, you know, exploring the same territory as a Chick Corea's electric band and, and a whole bunch of stuff, which I, 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 
was perturbed by, let us say. And then on top of that, where was John McLaughlin's guitar sound? He was playing guitar since I couldn't, I was trying to work out where he, who he was, you know, I, I knew his phrasing well enough to guess that this, that was him playing and not the keyboardist and all that type of stuff. Um, he then comes out with the um, next Mavish Orchestra album, Adventures in Radioland, which was a little bit heavier, a little bit more actual electric guitar playing on there. But for me, he seemed to be almost channeling um, the sort of guitar hero part of it. Now, we could argue the merits of these albums, but the one thing that is missing from them is that turmoil and darkness. Now, the other band that comes out in 71, 72, for me, that is the only other band that's really explored this darkness is King Crimson. Uh, so there was two albums for me. There was Birds of Fire from 72 and then there was Lark's Tongues in Aspic from 72. Now, I'm pretty sure that the, the, uh, the Bruford era King Crimson was influenced by the Mavish Nuxia. But Robert Fripp, to this day, has never turned his back on that darkness. It's there in his music right now. You know, the King Crimson that was filmed in the 80s had that. The King Crimson that emerged in the 90s had that darkness. That angular, you know, tortured darkness that they have. The heaviness. Fripp didn't turn away from it. It's always there. Whereas with John McLaughlin, he does. It's as though something changes. Something has gone. And as much as there's some burning guitar playing on Adventures in Ranger Land, um, it's not the same. It, it's hard to differentiate him from any other jazz fusion guitarist, except that he's a virtuoso guitarist. Then he seems to just disappear from view for me. He's, he's gone. You know, I'm, I'm a huge John McLaughlin fan. I'm trying to find out what he's doing. I hear rumours that he's doing a duo with uh, Jonas Helborg and they're going around and, and I want to try and see one of these gigs and I try and get to these gigs, can't get tickets. It's very hard to find out what he's doing. And then suddenly in 1989, he uh, announces a, a gig in London at Royal Festival. I go to that gig and that ends up being his, you know, live at the Royal Festival Hall album, which I feel is almost like if you can draw a line. So there's a, there is the Mavish Orchestra and then there's a diminishment. There's like a run out, you know, and the translators bands, one truth bands, translators bands, and then the reform, reformation of the Mavish Orchestra is all diminishing returns. We're just running down. And then he re-emerges. And here he re-emerges with a lot of the ideas that he explored um, with the translators, but much more defined. And I really like the Royal Festival Hall album. I think... Um, Here's a contentious idea. I think that John McLaughlin is only as great as the band he puts together. I think he's an incredible guitarist. He is a great composer that all the way through his career has been able to write very beautiful melodies. But I think the darkness that was there in the Mavishnu was down to, I think perhaps some sort of inner torment that was there with him uh, that created great music, but also it was a product of that band. And that Billy Comp and, and Rick Laird and Jan Hammer and Jerry Goodman were all providing that sound. It was greater than the sum of its parts. The reason why the band, I think, came to an end was because of that, because, um, the all the focus and credit was on John McLaughlin. I don't think John necessarily pushed that, but in terms of marketing, when the band first came out, if you look at that inner mountain flame, it says the Mavish Nuxia featuring John McLaughlin. He was the seller. So I'm sure those guys must have pulled up with, to so many venues with you know John McLaughlin and the Mavish Nuxia written outside. And I thought that created attention. Because it wasn't John's band, I think um, he was putting down full composer credit, which I think is simply, that's the jazz way of doing it, you know. Miles Davis has got his composer credits on so many tracks that he, uh, he, he, he definitely didn't compose. Um, we can hear riffs on Mavish and Orchestra records that um, John McLaughlin, oh, I did it wrong, John McLaughlin said on, played on Jack Johnson. 
you know, we can hear bits of uh, the, the first album, you know, at the beginning with those chords, the Dance and Mayer chords at the beginning of Jack Johnson. And on Jack Johnson, we also hear one of that, that famous guitar riff that's on, on the In the Mountain Flame, you know. You know, that, that um, riff. So, but Miles would have got comp compositional credit. So John just carries on in that way. And that created a, a tension, I think, that just exploded in a way that should never have happened. Um, but what, that points to the fact of how important the musicians are. That group with Kai Etgart and Trilock Gertu that is on the um, Royal Festival L album is an incredible band. And they are both bringing something to the party that is makes that band greater than some of its parts. So my argument is that um, I don't think the Translators band or the Reform Mahavishnu band had, they had incredible players in, but not players that were bringing in something unique of themselves. I think this is something that John McLaughlin feeds off. He needs those players. Uh, Trilock Goethe had basically reinvented drumming and percussion playing. It's hard to say that he's even a drummer. Is he a percussionist or a drummer? Kai Edgard had all that stuff. Jonas Helborg had it as well. And I think that, that was the one guy in the Mavish structure. And it, what it is, is a summation of everything that Jaco Pastorius had done and everything that slap bass players had done, that Stanley Clark had done. By the 80s, there's certain bass players that had that all down. And um, the slap bass that's in that band, in the Royal Festival Hall band, underpins it. Later on, when he brings in uh, Dominic de Piazza, who's an incredible soloist, I felt that that band was not quite the same. All right? So here's an argument I'm putting forward, is that... Perhaps the reason why we don't hear what we hear in the Mavish Nuxia again is because he didn't have those bands that could do that for him. Um, the band that he's worked with most recently um, for a long time, I have sort of, I'll be honest here, I never listened to those albums. It's, it's, it, it's, it's become formularised for me. It's like everything that... John McLaughlin has been doing over the last few years has been formalised into a sort of beboppy head, you know, certain odd time signatures, which is a very mathematical as an underpinning. Uh, the solos are very, you know, streams of sixteenth notes. We don't so much get the screaming, bending guitar solos that um, brought me to the fold. So um, I can listen to them, enjoy them because I love John McLaughlin, but um, I don't find his latest band. Um, I'm trying to think what these latest bands called, and uh, I can't even think what they're called. This is this is the thing. We've got forty years of polite jazz fusion. That thing has gone. That was there with the Mavish structure. This happens to many artists, but for some artists it doesn't. Some artists throughout their career, Frank Zappa is one. Robert Fripp is one, maintains the, the vibe, the, the thing that makes them who they are. With John McLaughlin, it disappeared 40 years ago. And we're li listening to a different artist. And what we're really appreciating is the sort of a, um, European, pretty guitar virtuoso music that he now makes which is infused with um, Indian music, but in a much more um, conscious, obvious way. Um, his last great album for me was Floating Point. And I think in, on Floating Point, his use of Indian classical musicians, the fact that those Indian classical musicians at that, that point then caught up with jazz and were able to operate within a jazz fusion band, all right? which also I think came from John's increased understanding of the form. On that album, it is incredibly impressive because of the input from those musicians and it's, it's, it's great to hear that. But Again, some of the compositions for me are very light. They're very airy. There is a certain 
certain grain to John's contemporary compositions that are almost like the complete opposite of the Mavish structure. Now, recently, John has then returned to that music. After years of going out live, and you would never expect him to play a Mavish Nortra track, which is very strange, because if you go and see the Rolling Stones, you know they're going to play Satisfaction or Jumping Jack Flash, you know. Um, but John, for years and years, like 40 years or so, didn't return to the catalogue that had made him a millionaire. Uh, and then suddenly, he... Um, with his, um, his new band, he recorded Mavish New Tracks at Ronnie Scott's. And it, the album is interesting, that Ronnie Scott's album is interesting, because on the cover, we see John outside Ronnie Scott's. And he's returning to Ronnie Scott's. He had played there in the 60s, which is where I started with this tour. He had played there so many times. He's, and he's returning there now. You know, he, he would have jammed there with Rick Laird in the 60s, playing with all sorts of different visiting you know, jazz legends. Um, he's ret he suddenly returned to what he did before. Um, and then he went out and did that tour um, where he put like a double group together uh, and played the Mavish New stuff full out. Um, for me, listening to that again, the compositions are there and the compositions inherently have in them that darkness but i don't really hear it in the music that darkness has has gone and um i think for many mclaughlin fans that is something that we're all aware of and i have many friends who uh their enjoyment of john mclaughlin which will be one of their favorite artists is limited only to the 1970s albums right so we get to the final part of this um, let's reevaluate these albums you know um, I do not think John McLaughlin has really broken ground in the last 40 years um, except for in little areas where he has pushed perhaps the integration of jazz with Indian classical music um, and also the ref ref reformation of Shakti which again for me does not have the vibe and vitality of the original Shakti although I love the, the Remembering Shakti albums um, but he does return there playing electric guitar in, in that ensemble which for me the whole point about Shakti is he's playing acoustic guitar. He's, he's, he's bringing the two worlds together. And this comes, there's another thing here. Part of the thing I loved about John McLaughlin in the 70s was that brutal guitar sound. His guitar sound now has become very, very sort of chorusy and polite. So there's a lot of things about John McLaughlin's recent music that doesn't chime with what I discovered when I first heard Birds of Fire. Um, I listen to these albums all the time and I thought for this video I'm going to reappraise one album to see what I really think about it and I'm going to pick one that I don't like. Now um, the one thing I haven't talked about that the big defining change between the Mavishnu period, Shakti 70s period, and then this period we've been talking about, is the um, the Guitar Trio album, live in San Francisco. Is that what it's called? My brain's getting <laughs> so fried. Um, which um, is, he made it with Paco de Luthia, he made it with um, Aldi Miola, it's his biggest selling album. This album sold 8 million copies. It's without doubt the biggest thing John McLaughlin ever did. And it sits right on that point. Um, listening to um, Saturday Night in San Francisco, which obviously the album's called Friday Night in San Francisco. I, I now know the error that I said, which put me off earlier. 
So listening to the news Saturday night in San Francisco, we have a version of Meeting of the Spirits. I wish this had been on the first album. When I came to the Guitar Trio, it wasn't through those these albums at all. It was through the live at um, the Royal Albert Hall video he made with Larry Cohen and Paco Delithia, where they do an incredible version of Meeting of the Spirits, which although acoustic, has all the torture and torment and everything I expect from John McLaughlin. I used to watch that over and over again. And I used to see John playing and all and, and in his playing reaching up for some divine inspiration that was coming pouring out of the guitar. And he was so overwhelmed by that that he keeps pushing the guitar closer and closer into the mic, and the mic is grinding into the acoustic guitar strings sort of creating something that's really, you know, saturated and overblown. He's really trying to push that guitar, acoustic guitar to the limit. This is recorded in 1979. It's still there. It's still there at that point, right? But that album, maybe the success of, of it, I don't know, maybe the, the fact that the sort of flamenco European vibe that I've been talking about sold so much that there's a whole new audience that emerged and then it was felt the best was to try and capitalize that with the albums that followed. I don't know, I just don't know. Um, but that that album, for me, you know, Friday Night San Francisco, for me is perhaps the last time we hear that brutal, destroy everything style. That I'm, that I'm describing, right? In 1996, they reformed um, the trio and brought an album called The Trio. Now, this never gets discussed. You know, when we think that there's a, a, a group here that uh, had sold 8 million copies, they reformed in 1996. At the time, there was a big thing about the reform reformation of the trio. And this album came out, recorded at Real World in 1996. There was a tour that went with it. And it sort of just was bleh. All right? When, if you go back to uh, my, you know, where I go through every John McLaughlin album and sort of review them, I'm pretty sure when I get to that album, and I haven't checked this, but I'm pretty sure I say it, 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 it last, lacked the spirit, it lacked the heart, you know, it lacked... Um, whatever the first album is not quite there. And, I, and I've always been very, very disappointed by that album. One of my least favorite John McLaughlin albums. So I've, I've listened to it all week, right? And as I've been listening to it, I've been able to, I think, pin, you know, pinpoint some of the problems with that album, but also start to see some of the, the incredible greatness of that album as well. Um, John McLaughlin, over the last four years, and I've said this before on the video, but I'm really going to try and pinpoint this now. He's been exploring a sort of European version of jazz, which takes in Indian classical music to a certain extent, but, you know, Latin and Spanish forms much more, and French music folk forms. It's a bon viveur music approach. It's happy, it's joyous. It, it, isn't, it doesn't have that um, tension, that existentialist threat, that turmoil. It's not in there at all. It's much more about, you know, sitting in the sunshine in the south of France, you know, drinking a nice wine and, and eating olive oil and lovely bread or whatever John spends his day doing. It's much more about that. And the compositions that John brings in on that trio album are just full of joy. That's what he is after. He is trying to put joy out there. Now, um, in the old days, the Mavishnu was trying to transmit joy, but it didn't come across like that. It was terror to me. Um, and listening to it, I thought, if you now accept what John's trying to do, we have these beautiful melodies, incredible guitar playing. His, his guitar playing has only improved as time has gone on, I think. Um, this, the reason I think that trio album was not as successful as the original one was because, A, it's not live. It doesn't capture that interplay. 
that is on the Royal Festival Hall. I think uh, so often McGoughlin is at his best when he is captured live. I think that's one of the aspects. The production, it's been a lot more produced. I absolutely love Passion, Grace and Fire, the this, this second studio album. I love it more than uh, Friday Night in San Francisco. Um, and um, that album feels like three guitarists, three microphones, and they're playing and they're playing with each other and there's a sense of interplay and the joy of them being together and and a, a, a friendly camaraderie but also competition that you feel on the album. This album's not like that, it's far more produced. This is another thing that I think has really cursed Modern Fusion is once we get to a certain point where everybody is able to dial in their performances, the computers can edit them and we can overdub this and so much easier you now have a billion tracks. It's it's so often taken the fire out of uh, out of um you know out of what jazz musicians do. Um even if people all work in the walk in the same room and mic up and play they're playing and recording onto digital technology. It's so easy after then, you know, to edit, to stretch, to, you know, cut things out, to improve. And of course this goes on all the time and I think it pulls the heart out of it. So I think the other thing is, is, is McLaughlin is suffering because his 70s music was so um, dependent on being in that moment and reaching for that, climax you know that that terrifying climax that the mavish nuxia was always trying to reach for um it's so much harder to do that now with modern technologies even if you do record a band live um the tape doesn't saturate right the moment isn't as precious um people can record gig after gig because the hard drives will take more recording and it's easier to set up and it's easier to take the pick the performance that doesn't go wrong. You know, it's interesting when with the uh, reissue of the uh, Saturday Night in San Francisco. Of course, that was recorded on tape, and the record company had to go through a big process of um, trying to get the best they could out of those tapes. And those tapes would have been limited in what they did. And there's a conversation where Aldi Miller says, you know, John McLaughlin called him up. He said, just put it out, mistakes and everything. Um, and that shows that McLaughlin is not one of those precious musicians. He 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 he's still in there, but I just wonder whether the the modern world is conducive for him doing that. Um, so that's another aspect we've got. I think um, the production does is not conducive anymore to um, portraying that that aspect of music. Um, his interest is not to portrayal turmoil he wants to spread joy and that's in his compositions um and i think that is what you hear i think the thing that has come out and i i, I didn't um part of the things i try and do with these videos is I'm, I'm trying to record my thought process and i try at the end of any video to come up with a conclusion that i didn't know at the start and doing this video i think now one thing that's very interesting is perhaps the su success of the trio album um, then influenced the commercial, commercial mechanism that John McLaughlin exists in to push him towards stuff which is much more flamenco, Spanish, European based, which is the sound of the trio. Um, it's an area that Aldi Miolo has also pursued since then. Um, upsetting the fans that really wanted to plug the Les Paul back in and you know do race through the devil on the Spanish highway you know uh, and he, he has returned to that since then but with that with the same problem it, it not having the the guts and the heart and the the brutality that those original albums had um it is probably as simple as the fact that musicians get older uh, they become wiser they become more um, moderate in their interests, more conservative perhaps. Maybe it happens to us all. Um, and it's as simple as that. 
But what I really wanted to do on this video was explore and get out of there this idea that for, for the whole host of us, and I'm sure for many people watching this channel, the real heart was back in the early 70s. Um, and those albums will be there and they'll be there forever. Um, I would like to finish by saying um, there's so much stuff on these later albums. I think if you listen to The Promise and you check out the track Jazz Jungle, you can hear John McLaughlin trying to recapture that sort of excitement. So it is there. It's not cut and dried. It's not like all the albums are one thing and another. Um, when he's done things like the album where the time remembered where he explores the music of um, Bill Evans and it's very very beautiful and pretty he's done that very successfully I, I think the last 30 odd years John McLaughlin has been in he's been interested in beauty he's been interested in prettiness he's been interested in joy in happiness he's been interested in um, expressing the world that he lives in in the south of France which is sunshine and and the Mediterranean that is what his interests have been for the last how many years not standing on stage in a white suit trying to express the torment of trying to achieve some sort of spiritual bliss that is the end of my video um, I hope you enjoyed this chat this was for hardcore uh, John McLaughlin fans I hope I managed to say his name right and all the uh, those uh, the grammar Nazis, pronunciation Nazis are happy now. And they go, oh, Andy, Andy finally listened. He, he gave in. We knew he couldn't carry on like that. And in his ignorance of saying his name, you know, saying his name wrong is absolutely terrible. You know, um, yeah. So um, I hope you appreciate that. Um, I will be returning very soon with some videos on the great uh, jazz fusion guitarist um, John Abercrombie. B I E. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to find a new bad pronunciation of another jazz. I'm not really going to do that. I was just going to. I couldn't even. It's, ja, it's John Abercrombie. I can't say it. Uh, John John Abercrombie. I can't find up a bad pronunciation. You know, there's Pat Metheny and Pat Metheny. There's that one. Why don't we get that one up? I say Pat Metheny. Is it not Pat Metheny? Let's go for that one. And then you can have a go at me about that. You know, so I'm going to have to do a bat video on Pat Metheny next. Aren't I? It's the only way to keep them happy. I don't want to lose them. I don't want them unsubscribing because uh, I'm not... Uh, pronouncing stuff wrong now I'm sure I pronounce a lot more wrong anyway I am in a waffling as I always do at the end of my videos if you like this video like if you uh, um, want to subscribe then obviously subscribe and you can hear, watch some more of this of me you know st me struggling with my thoughts on music in front of your very eyes for your listening and visual pleasure um, anyway thanks for watching I'll see you on the next video bye